In the next few videos, I'll be going through all the different varieties of bundle theories that Blackmore talks about. And so, as I said at the end of the last video, um, for the ego theory, there must be an answer to what yourself is. Whatever yourself goes with your ego, and so wherever the ego is, that's why yourself is. Uh, for the bundle theory, then we need to try to figure out um, how the bundle theorist is uh, is is answering the question of of whether whether you're the same self or not the same self. And so we need to think about what accounts for the unity. And so for each of these theorists, we'll be looking for what makes the theory unified. The first theory is James's two-part theory of the self. And the first part uh, for, uh, for James, the first part of the self, is the empirical self, what he refers to as the me. And the empirical self has three components. The first component is the uh, material self, um, and that's my body, my possessions. So what makes me the person that I am, as I said in the last video, is partly the fact that I have this body, that I am a particular five feet tall, uh, you know, I have uh, a nice house, I have a dog. Um, those are, are parts of, of me. They're aspects of who I am, the material aspects of who I am. Uh, the second part of the empirical self is the social self, that I am a part of a network of people. I am a mother, I am a daughter, I'm a, a member of, of a family, I have friends, I have students, I have uh, colleagues. So all of those relationships are also very important to define the nature of myself, of who I am. So that's uh, another aspect of the me that, that makes me the self that I am. Um, and then the third part is really interesting to think about as, uh, as the empirical self because in many respects we think of the spiritual self as the kind of dualist extra stuff uh, that, that uh, a person might think of as an ego. But James classifies the spiritual self as an aspect of the empirical self um, along with your character, your personality, your subjective experience, your sensations, attention, volition. Uh, those are aspects of, of, of who you are that he uh, considers to be uh, bodily, um, to be physical in a, in a fundamental sort of way. That, you know, that these, are, these are things that happen, that happen to you in this empirical sort of way. So he classifies the spiritual self as one of the components of the empirical self. That's the first part. So all three of those components are the first part of James's two-part theory of the self. Um, so all of those are, are really elements of the bundle, uh, that you have a particular visual sensation, that you're looking at something or another, uh, that you own whatever it is that you own. And so bits of those, that bundle can come and go, and you'd still be the same self you are. So what accounts for the unity for James? This fundamental question, and what accounts for the unity is the subjective self. So this is the second part of the self for James. The subjective self is the I. It's the unified part of the self. It's what holds the other aspects of the bundle together. Um, and he talks about this um, I, uh, this, this unifying aspect of it, as a thought. Uh, I've got it capitalized here in the slide. Uh, James sometimes talks about this as the master thought. Uh, and it's this thought that collects your thoughts and sensations, your other thoughts and sensations, together as mine. So you have this idea of this thought that then owns and, and, and um, uh, gathers together all of these other sensations and thoughts and says, yeah, that one's mine, that feeling is mine, that thought is mine. So it, it, it kind of stamps all of these other thoughts and sensations together as as my sensation. So that's why they're part of the me and the 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 thought, this master thought is the I. Um, so it's not an ego theory because the thought uh, transfers from one thought to the next. It's a series of master thoughts that one has over the course of a day, a life. I'm not quite sure exactly uh, how long a specific thought lasts. Uh, and this is something that you could ask yourself, you know, does this make sense? How, how might this work? Um, the idea is that there is this master thought and that it then um, uh, gives over subjectivity to the next thought 
and that to the next thought, and that to the next thought, and that's what determines the unity of all of the other aspects of the material, or uh, the empirical self. Uh, and the, um, the slogan here, the thought itself is the thinker, is, uh, is the basic idea, that there's, there doesn't need to be an extra ego or a little self, a little homunculus or anything like that. Um, it's just you know, one of your thoughts that takes ownership that is the unifier of the other thoughts that you have and the other sensations that you have that determines who you are as yourself. The next view is uh, the developmental view of the self, and this view has been put forward by Antonio Damasio, who is a uh, neuropsychologist, and he considers uh, the, the self to be something that uh, develops over the course of three stages, and you can also think about this in evolutionary terms, uh, because you, we'll talk later in the semester about animals, and you want to think, well, do animals have a self? Uh, do they need consciousness to have a self, or can you have a self without consciousness? Do you need self-reflection? Do you need self-awareness to have consciousness or to have a self? These are questions that you might ask. On Damasio's view, you can start with what he calls the proto-self, which is a very the very kind of base uh, level for having a self, and it involves having an egocentric sensory map. So when you're navigating around the world, your sensations tell you where you are relative to the world so that you can figure out what you need to do to get to where you need to go. And every organism needs this. Uh, plants need this, need to know where they're leaves are relative to the sun so they can orient themselves in various directions. Certainly moving animals need to be able to orient their, themselves in their environment towards positive things and away from negative things. So this, this proto-self is an egocentric sensory map um, and for more complex multimodal creatures like us, then we need to integrate those together so that we can have uh, a, you know, a sense of where we are in the world as, a, as an organism. Uh, so that's the first, uh, first stage. The second stage is the core self, which is the ability to distinguish internal from external states. On Damasio's view, the core self is where consciousness enters. So he thinks consciousness is having this, you know, this internal, he talks about it as a movie in the mind, um, you know, which has some problematic theater aspects to it, uh, but, you know, but committed to this idea that there are internal states and then there are external states, and I can distinguish when I am uh, uh, imagining or, um, or having, uh, having uh, a memory of something, I can distinguish a feeling of mine or a pain of mine from a feature of the world and a capacity to understand that as opposed to the proto-self idea which is more of a, a simple responsiveness to the world, orienting in the world, uh, maybe learning in relation to the world. The core self uh, is a more discriminating sort of self, a more discriminating ability to distinguish what my insides are from what is external to me. And then the third stage of, of self-development, according to Damasio, is the autobiographical self. And in this uh, development, you have a memory of your past experiences and the capacity to imagine future experiences. Uh, so when you develop the autobiographical self, that's when you develop a kind of self-consciousness, a self-awareness, an ability to um, uh, recognize that I am a self. At the core self level and the proto-self level, you're recognizing that you're a being in the world, but you don't think of yourself as a self. Uh, as a being that exists through time and that lasts through time. So only at the level of an autobiographical self could you even ask the question, what is a self? Uh, so, um, so that is an additional stage uh, that you might not have for the first two. Uh, the first, you might be an animal that only has a core self. You might be an animal that only has a proto self. Uh, humans have autobiographical selves. So, are we the only animals that have selves? This is something that you need to ask yourself, and will help determine what constitutes the bundle. For Damasio, um, you know, each level has a bundle, each level is a kind of self, and what unifies the self is somewhat different at each stage. 
The next theory of the self is the phenomenal self model. And uh, here, um, the suggestion is that there are patterns of neural activity that represent the world in relation to the self. So similar to this kind of egocentric, centric, egocentric map and, and, and core self idea that Damasio suggests, for Metzinger, the, um, the phenomenal self model is, is the, the model that I have of, of the world and myself in relation to the world. That idea for Metzinger is that you produce a sense, your experiences produce a sense of yourself in the world, your, your, your body in the world, your, your subjectivity in the world, and they're um, mutually specified that uh, who I am has to do with how I'm representing things around me. And so, you know, so I represent that, you know, this camera is in front of me and my PowerPoint is in behind and things are to the right and left and people are walking by and, you know, this is how I'm, this is my phenomenal world that I am representing. Um, and uh, it's important that the self model is transparent. So I represent myself as being in the world, right? So, so this is the body, this is the, the subjectivity that's in the world. But unless I'm being self-reflective, I don't, that, that, that self model is transparent. I don't think about my self model. If I'm walking across the room, I don't think, oh, you know, here is this self that's walking across the room and I need to put this foot forward and this foot forward. No, I don't think about my phenomenal self model. I don't think about the fact that I have a model of the world that I'm using to navigate the world. Um, it's transparent. My self model is transparent. I use it. It is how I experience the world, but I, um, I don't reflect on that model itself unless something goes wrong and we'll see uh, later on uh, when we think about out-of-body experiences and Metzinger has done some really interesting work with with bodies and virtual bodies uh, of, of how you can manipulate that phenomenal self model through various different perceptual tweakings and so forth um, but normally we don't uh, we don't think about that we don't reflect on our phenomenal self model it's just how we uh, manage to navigate the world. Uh, but that, that model is limited by our senses, and Metzinger talks about this as an ego tunnel. Don't be confused by the, this, this idea of, of ego, this word ego. Um, so he talks about it as an ego tunnel just because ego is another word that we use for the self. Um, he's not an ego theorist. He thinks that the self model is something that's constructed and that it changes over the course of time. Uh, so he's a bundle theorist. Um, and so when he's talking about the ego tunnel, what he's talking about is is the way in which my experience, my phenomenal self model, my experience of the world, is determined by the particular sensations that I have. Uh, I can see colors. There are animals that can't see colors. There are people who can't see colors. Um, I can hear things. I um, see only a particular range of, of visible light. Um, well, I see all of visible light because light is de visible light is defined according to human uh, sensory capacities. But I see only a, a, a limited range of the um, of of. Uh, light frequencies that are capable of being seen by other visual systems. So, um, so bees have their own ego tunnels. They see a different range of, of light reflectance frequencies um, than I do, and they see different kinds of things that are attuned to different kinds of things in their environment. So the idea that um, uh, our self model is a tunnel is the idea that we go through the world and we see the world according to how our senses present the world to us uh, and and we we can't see outside of that we don't experience the world outside of the phenomenal model of the world that is produced by the particular ways that our sensations construct us uh, so that's the phenomenal self model that's Metzinger Okay, last view is the narrative self, and uh, we'll recognize this narrative self from Dennett. Dennett, uh, you'll remember, is the multiple drafts theorist. He talked about consciousness as a matter of uh, numerous different drafts being produced. Uh, over the course of time and consciousness as simply uh, you know, the draft that gets reported at the end. And that connects very well with his view of the self. Um, we've got this basic idea that there
there are drafts of experiences that make uh, sense of our thoughts and sensations and actions over time. So I'll produce a draft of my experience right now, and that's going to be part of the narrative that forms myself. Um, but importantly, we're not uh, drafts form a narrative, um, but importantly, we're not the only ones who are composing the narrative that forms myself. Um, also involved are uh, language, culture, and social interactions. They both shape how I form the narrative, what, you know, what kinds of things I'm inclined to remember, what kinds of things I'm inclined to think are important. Uh, those are shaped by my language and culture. Uh, but also other people will tell stories about me. Uh, so this is similar to James's empirical self that, you know, that other people are important to my sense of self. And so other people will tell stories about me. And in many ways, those uh, stories will be more important uh, to who I am, to my narrative self, than stories that I tell myself. Uh, you know, that you can think about this in terms of, of your parents. Your parents have told you stories about your early life. You may not remember anything from when you were a baby or when you were very young, but your parents tell all kinds of stories about that, and that becomes part of your narrative of yourself and part of the reason that you think that you are the same person uh, that you were when you were a baby uh, because you were crying whiny then and you're crying whiny now, or you were a beautiful baby then and you're a beautiful human being now. You know, whatever those stories, those stories stories of continuity that are told by ourselves and by um, people are, uh, you know, by our loved ones or hated ones, um, these are all part of the narrative that determines uh, what our self is. Uh, so uh, Dennett talks about this as, um, as the self, the I, is the center of narrative gravity. The I is simply that which is the focus of the collection of the narrative that determines myself as, um, you know, as the self that continues over the course of time. And with all of those, all of these theories, as with everything else we're doing in this class, uh, try to connect the theory to your own experience. Try to think about how the theory applies to the different thought experiments that we've considered, the real cases of dissociative identity and split brain. Um, which theory makes the most sense of all of the different kinds of things, all of the different kinds of factors that go into how we think about the nature of the self.